Welcome, everybody, to a very special Aeon Byte interview, sort of a continuation of what we've been doing on AB Live on an important topic, especially as we are changing an age, as we will discuss, and uh, continuing to defend the mystic and the meek out there, from the Gnostics to the Cathars to all of you thinking that these are really weird times, Gnostic times, the, the threat of the Gnostics, as he said, or as I call it, a Philip K. Dick world. So we continue this, and as always, it's great to have Amanda Radcliffe. Amanda, long time no talk, huh? Yeah, how long has it been? About a week? <laughs> yes, <laughs> something like that, yes, but there's so much to talk about, even Usually afterwards, you and I will have an interview, we'll talk on Messenger, and it seems like all the cool stuff we talk about on Messenger, all the really juicy, personal, intense stuff we share there. So there's so much to share. And with us too, it is definitely an honor and a pleasure to have Richard Stanley. Richard, thank you very much for coming on. Great to talk to you. It's a pleasure being on the show, sir. And um, I've never been here before, but um, feels familiar. As I call it, I call it the virtual Alexandria. It's a, a hope. It's a place that at least online we can all talk like an ancient Alexandria and be free and open and share ideas and inventions. So you are definitely more than welcome. So uh, I think uh, starting, uh, Amanda, we should start with you. We did that interview on why the Cathars didn't exist or why they existed. We were defending. We were doing our apologetics on why they mm -hmm. existed and you and i were suffering from a fever a literal fever not a mystic fever uh so is there anything you were thinking after the interview that you wanted to mention now not anything that i can think about i mean we got onto a different thread didn't we in our private conversation afterwards um so I, I, not really anything related to that subject no i mean what um what I said to you that I thought Richard could bring up. Yeah, yeah, please let us know, Richard. You, you're the one who came up with the coolest title, Cancel Culture Cathar. So I'm sure you have things to say about this. I, I certainly do. So, well, I guess um, I, I could start that by um, defining the way that um, cancel culture works which is very much an evolution on the um history belongs to the victor um maxim but um we're living in a period where it would seem to me that um reality is maintained by um the technosphere at least the holding pattern for um consensus reality is maintained by what people um hear and read over the um over the net as opposed to in days gone by when it would have been the printed word. That is true. And uh, why do you have any ideas why people might be saying, because on this show I've defended why the classic Gnostics existed, because there is a movement that is coming around saying why the Gnostics didn't exist. Uh, people, I feel, have their agendas to make the Gnostics into, instead of these ancient rebels and mystics, into sort of hoity-toity, nice little Christians who believed in reincarnation and were more feminist, if you would, but they sort of uh, cuck them. They take away their edge. Uh, do you? Why do you feel people might well, even today, sort of try to marginalize the Cathars, or could this even be sort of adopt them into the Catholic Church? I mean, the Church did a kind of apologize quietly to the Cathars a few years ago. Well, I mean, every generation um, reinvents the Cathars for themselves, more or less. So they've morphed over the course of the um, the twentieth century, and um, there was a time when they were considered to be um, basically medieval hippies, and um, there's times when they're considered to be the original true Christianity, and um, there was a time not so long ago in the eighties um, and nineties when they were heavily promoted by the um, the French Republic as a tourism initiative, 
which is when they pretty much rebranded the um, the south of France as Pays Qatar, and suddenly there were um, Qatar friendly road signs blossoming along the freeways. That all actually happened in the 80s and 90s, but um, since then there's been a pushback. Uh, most of those um, Pays Qatar signs have disappeared. And um, you don't see that many stylized Qatar Dove imp impressions anymore in shop windows or on um, on postcards. And there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, as with um, pretty much everything to do with um, cancel culture and the Great Reset, um, folk think that it's a that it's a spontaneous rational decision on their behalf to make one choice or another, but there's usually vested um, political or um, corporate interests um, behind it. In this case, um, I think the um, regionally out here, the main problem is has been that um, the French Republic um, now perceives um, the section of history as being um, uh, uh, encouraging separatist tendencies. Um, essentially, it smacks of regionalism to um, r remind people that Occitania was once an independent country uh, that was essentially genocidally persecuted by the rest of Europe. Um, seems like a bad idea, I guess, to the authorities in the face of what's happened in Catalonia. I mean, um, Catalonia basically ceased to exist around about the same time that Occitania ceased to exist for roughly the same reasons. And there's been a strong push for an independent um, Catalonia over the last few years, which has um, led to a, um, a very strong rebuttal by the um, by the French government and the incarceration of most of the um, the Catalan leadership. And I guess out of fear of engendering a similar um, Occitan separatism here in the south, there's been a, a quiet sort of roll back of all those ideas. Um, we're seeing a lot of things disappearing out of museums and disappearing out of um, out of tour guides. Mm -hmm. And um, the south of France has kind of gone back to being a place remembered for its beaches. Um, but um, <clears throat> and some yeah archaeological interest if you scroll down to page three. And um, yeah, throughout there's been a, a slight editing out of um, of the Cathar history, and a, a, and a desire to try and pretend that it was all um, over dramatized, that it was somehow um, romanticized and um, misunderstood. The um, Catholic Church also plays a role in that because um, the Catholic Ch apology did not go nearly deep enough or um, far enough. Um, there was a, um, a deputation of um, Holy Roman prelates that came to Montsegur in 2016 who offered a very um, tersely worded apology, um, which basically um, where they apologized for um, how the Holy Roman Church performing um, acts um, contrary to the Gospels, I think was the wording, and um, fighting fire with fire, which implied that the Cathars had fired first. And, um, then a, um, a request was made by um, the Archbishop of Pamir, our, our senior religious prelate here in the South, um, Father Jean-Marc Aichen, um, requested that Pope Francis come in person. Um, this request was repeated by our senior political leader, um, the mayor of Toulouse. But um, unfortunately, the Holy See did not respond. Uh, and there's been no um, papal delegation to Toulouse to, um, to formally recognize this. And um, approaches made to the Dominican order to acknowledge the Inquisition, um, to apologize for the centuries of persecution under the, um, yeah, the, the Black Guard monks under the Inquisition has also been um, ignored. And I feel at some point until those crimes are understood, um, acknowledged, it's, there's going to rem it's going to remain a bit of a, um, an open wound. Oh yeah, <clears throat> certainly people have uh, their identity and the land never forgets. If anything, the spirits never forget. They are there to remind us and they are, they're very powerful. And uh, would you say uh, distinctly, what do you think are the most uh, distinct uh, ideas that definitely show that the Cathars did exist? They weren't just, uh, you know, free-minded Catholics? Um. 
Well, a lot of folk, I guess, are quibbling over the use of the word Cathar because obviously they didn't use it themselves. Right. And that's, right. um, for me, it, it, it's really just a, a, a quibble because um, back in those days, they spoke a totally different language. The people down here were speaking Occitan. So you might as well say that, yeah, the word man or woman does, didn't exist back then because they didn't, they weren't speaking in English. Um, but at the time, they would have um, described themselves simply as Christians. But um, rather than being um, re a rebellious tranche of Christianity, I, they, I think the evidence really suggests that they were highly organized. The um, initial um, spread of um, Catharism through the South took place extremely quickly. And um, there was quite a, um, a hierarchy in the way they went about it. The, um, the perfecti, the adepts, generally traveled in twos, in pairs. They had a very... Um, organized way of um, proselytizing. They, um, in, they ingratiated their way into different Christian communities, pretending to be fellow Christians, were generally hard workers, often weavers, tisserands, and um, won people over through their, their honesty and through their hard work, and often didn't mention any heretical ideas for maybe one or two years after getting into the community and then always started with the thin end of the wedge, always um, started with small little quibbles about the um, the issue of the Holy Communion or um, why, why it is that we're worshipping a cross, a torture item, and um, hedged slowly into the bigger heretical concepts like the idea of the, um, of the world not being created by the true God. And um, they were pretty much trained to do that. I think there was a period of about two years training to become to become an adept. And it was um, done in a very um, premeditated manner. And as a result, the um, the faith spread extremely rapidly like wildfire and um, practically took over the whole of Europe in a, uh, in a very, very um, short period of time. And throughout all this, they were um, organizing themselves into dioceses and, and bishoprics and show a, um, a, a kind of pragmatism, which, uh, which um, I, I think isn't very um, ethereal at all. And show, it shows a, um, a, a very um, strong and organic movement that was um, highly organized and extremely determined and who um, would have taken down the Holy Roman Church had they not been met with, um, with force. Indeed. And do you see, uh, like I do, the the Cathars? <clears throat> and I wanted to just mention it's interesting because many of the Gnostics, classical Gnostics, did not consider themselves, uh, never called themselves Gnostic. In fact, uh, they called themselves Christians. And if some have said, uh, when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Manichaeans very strangely started calling themselves Christians. And you think, well, it's probably for marketing purposes because around that time is when the Manichaeans just exploded across the world. Cause like, Hey, we're Christians, you know, Hey, <laughs> of course they, uh, you know, they absorbed Jesus, they absorbed Buddha, Zoroaster, the, you know, the Manichaeans just took whoever they thought was their apostle of light. But the, I see it as the Manichaeans spread. They touch on the Bogomils, they influence the Bogomils, Paulinists in the Byzantine Empire, and then the Cathars, they have their council. Is that the history you see, Richard? Yeah, I think it's very much a continuum. I mean, um, the early, um, the, the, the first contact between the Holy Roman Church and the Cathars, generally the Catholics referred to them as Manichaeans at the top. They referred to it as the Manichaean plague or the Manichaean pestilence that was sweeping through the south. Um, they'd, they'd sort of succeeded in putting the kibosh on the Manichaeans about 200 years previously. And um, as a result, most of the, um, the prelates who were encountering the Cathars had never really encountered heresy before in their in their lifetimes and uh, it took them a while to uh, really even figure out what was happening and um, yeah they certainly joined at the hip to the Manichaeans and to the Bogomils through the mysterious presence of um, Papa Nisitas or Nikitea or um, Nikita or however you want to pronounce him the um, Bogomil um, Archbishop of Constantinople 
who's supposed to have um, walked all the way over here in the 12th century, bearing with him the um, the Book of Love or the Book of the Seven Seals, and then set about um, very um, assertively um, organizing the, the formal Cathar Church. So there's, yeah, certainly a direct cross-pollination from the, um, yeah, the Bogomil cosmology. And you see books like uh, the uh, the Book of the Holy Supper, the Two Principles, you see them as authentic. These are not some sort of creation polemic by the church. Oh, it's so hard to know because um, one of the extraordinary things about uh, the situation is bringing us back to this cancel culture idea is that the, um, the Holy Roman Church fought them by erasing all of the data. Um, you can essentially make someone cease to exist by erasing their existence from the technosphere, which is um, what um, cancel culture is all about. Mm -hmm. And they did the same with the Cathars. They destroyed all of the records and all of their books and went to the extent of um, destroying the language, of uh, making certain that there were no um, Occitan speakers left and um, no printed works in Occitan. So, um, a lot of what we think we know is, um, yeah, put through a, a distorting mirror of these seven centuries of um, very severe censorship that's happened since. Yes, it is indeed. Uh, do you what? Do you have anything to say, Amanda? Or feel free to ask questions. You can, yeah, I was just you can host the show and take over. I do not Please. mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was just going to add that um, what we what we are left with, of course, the Inquisition records, which we can't always count on as being 100% reliable, given how they were extracted. Yes, that is true. You haven't had a Nag Hammadi library pop out like we were able to say, aha, the church fathers really weren't making up a lot of the stuff. They were actually recording and quoting fine, but with the Cathars, I don't think we've had anything, have we, that has come out independently? Well, there was that book, wasn't there, Richard, that was supposedly found in the wall in Montsegur by the Polaires? What was that well, called again? But, um, yeah, that was pretty much discredited. Uh, it was the, yeah. the wooden book of Montsegur, which was um, a, a book of Nadi astrology written on, written on palm leaves. Um, that was found in the wall of Montsegur by um, René Odin and Césaire Kamani, I think, um, and Mario Phil. But um, it's generally felt that they planted the book in the wall in order to legitimise their um, their secret society. Um, they'd been predicting the um, the revival of the Gnostic faith for years and years, and um, everyone had been waiting for the lost book of the Cathars to finally be discovered. And I guess um, it, they became impatient and, um, like a lot of folk, decided to make their own um, lost book. And um, that's something that's been going on for a while. And that um, obviously, um, given that we haven't got any direct um, data, I think ever since um, Jules Duanel um, started um, channeling the um, the ascended cast Cathar masters, there's been attempts to try and reach out astrally or spiritually to um, restore the um, the bro the line of initiation to um, to repair mm -hmm. the the web of time, um, often to. Um, yeah, to mixed effect, obviously, um, Jules Duanel um, channeled the, the Gnostic mass, which got um, appropriated by Alistair Crowley and rewritten into the, um, the central ritual of the OTO. Uh, but um, to what extent we can accept channeled information as being um, as big as being genuine or actually reflecting um, the, the Cathar doctrine itself, it's uh, that would be um, yeah, sadly, um, open to question. The no, no, no. <laughs> Richard, you promised you weren't going to say anything, but I'd get mad at. <laughs> but he was right, and a lot. He was. He did get some things right. He did describe the people right, or they got the names right. Yeah. He did. That's right. Jules Donnell. Obviously, I'm biased because he is a part of my initiatory chain, the uh, father of my church. But um, it, it, Jules, Jules Donnell with Lady Kate Ness in the salons of Paris. He I don't think he expected that he was going to receive this information. I don't think he sat down to, you know, reawaken the, the Cathar 
initiatory um, uh, stream. I think that it came by itself from what I understand of having read the transcriptions of the seance. But certainly he was a librarian in Orléans Library and he had access to old documents um, that nobody else had. And so when he received these names, these 13, I think it was 13, wasn't it, Richard? 13 Cathar bishops. Um, he, he was able to um, verify them through the records that he had access to. And I think that came as a shock to him actually to discover that these were real people with real names. And so that kind of created a snowball effect in which himself and Lady Cape Ness and other nobles um, became very invested in this ideology of recreating the era of Gnosis restored. And what's interesting to me about this as a woman, of course, is that Jules Donnell was the first person really to you know, genuinely ordain women with this, um, this stream, um, bearing in mind that there is the spiritual consecration that we have, but there is also the, the traditional um, Syriac Orthodox consecration that we have in the Gnostic Church. And it, it's very interesting what Richard said there about how that ritual which he channeled then became, you know, the central pivot of the ceremonies for the OTO, because Again, that's not really what Jules Donnell himself would have had in mind um, when he when he created this. Um, and certainly his idea of Bishop Sophia's was an interesting one, where he consecrated women and then insisted that they consecrate other women. And the first woman consecrated in the Gnostic Church was called Sophia Esclamont. And then Jules Donnell became himself the Bishop of Montsegur. Um, and so he, he used Monsignor as a spiritual home for the, the recreated Gnostic Church, as I'm sure you already know, but your viewers might not know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and a lot. <clears throat> Go ahead, Richard. No, it was certainly very good for you to recapitulate that. And some, I mean, the we take, a lot of these things, we take a lot of these things for granted because, you know, we've lived and breathed this for so many years now. So it's important, I think, that we, uh, we we can kind of go back to the beginning as well sometimes and explain where this came from. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the um, part of the um, the I guess the main vulnerability of the Cathar faith was this problem of the consolamentum, the uh, supreme mm -hmm. initiation that makes you into a Cathar adept, and um, without receiving the consolamentum, you're you're not really a fully initiated adept. Uh, because the consolamentum could only be received through an act of direct transmission by uh, touching the hand of an adept who had touched the hand of another adept, allegedly in an unbroken chain going back to the proto-Christianity of John the Baptist and the Essenes. Um, it spread a bit like a, um, like a virus. Um, mm. It had to be through direct um, physical contact. Um, mm. to, um, this made the um, faith vulnerable. The way that the Catholic Church and the Inquisition fought it was very much like a virus. They um, they start they figured out how to identify it and how to incinerate and cauterize anyone who had contracted it. Um, in a very short per period of time, in approximately a hundred years, they succeeded in tracking down and killing every single person who had uh, been initiated, um, thus severing the um, the the line of transmission, and. Um, brings us to this issue of, um, yeah, the D La Dernia Qatar, the last Cathar, um, Wilhelm Bellibast, um, who um, perished at the um, stake in 1321 and is thought to have been the, um, the last adept to have um, received the consolamentum. Um, he was a, a super complicated character. Uh, we know a lot about Bellybast thanks to the Inquisition register of um, Jacques Fournier. So um, a lot of his um, his dialogue and mannerisms have actually been passed down to us. And um, yeah, Bellybast before um, going to the stake is the man who allegedly um, uttered the um, so-called Cathar prophecy, which um, play, is sort of a, um, a paraphrased version of um, the revelation of St. John. It's, um, it says that um, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. A descendant of the House of Aragon will graze their horse on the altars in Rome. 
and uh, that after seven centuries, the, the laurel will turn green again. The laurier um, re 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 returns to, um, to blossoms again and the old ways return, which um, gives us a, 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 the seven centuries date. And yeah. um, folk have variously interpreted um, the passage of those seven centuries. A lot of people initially thought that it was seven centuries after the fall of Montsegur. So um, there were attempts to mark the anniversary in, um, on March 16th, 1944, mm. um, which was, I guess, when the, uh, the notion of the laurel turning green again first started to settle into people's heads. I know when the Holy Roman prelates arrived in Montsegur in 2016, they were all bearing sprigs of, deep, of green laurel uh, as a, um, a sign of um, recognizing the, uh, the prophecy. And um, if we were to date it from um, 20, from 1321, then obviously it gives us um, 2021, our, our present era, as the um, the point in time when the prophecy is meant to fall due. And um, yeah, how to bridge that gap of seven centuries of of silence? Um, the original um, book of the Cathars is has never turned up. Um, there's been different theories as to what it might have been. Um, no one knows for sure. In the um, in the 20th century, they thought it was um, the Lost Gospel of St. John. Uh, um, the Lost Gospel of St. John that the Polars and the Rosicrucians were seeking so earnestly in the 20s and 30s has um, subsequently turned up amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls and is now um, available on last and uh, um, in the coming into the 21st century, folk are now uh, often believe that it was the um, the lost gospel of Mary Magdalene. Mm, fascinating. And what do you think uh, the prophecy is? Amanda and I have talked about it, Richard. I mean, um, if Amanda wants to share, I think it's similar. As I keep telling her, dream time is here. I think the ancient ways of Tiamat and the lunar powers are coming back. Similar, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Alan Moore's Providence, where actually the, the, the Cthulhu coming back is a good thing, but we're resisting it, so it appears <laughs> as monsters, but it's actually, we are going back to our old ways of thinking, the integrated brain, the holistic. So it's dream time, and it seems horrific. I think that's where we're heading, Richard, but what do you think? I mean, I like to speculate <laughs> well I, I frankly i couldn't agree more um i think cthulhu gets a lot of bad press um the <laughs> lord of dreams <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, lovecraft's um, old ones aren't evil they're um they're metaphoric um representations of natural forces and things which are entirely beyond um, human morality uh, this notion of um, planet Earth waking up and um, turning against mankind is, um, yeah, super prevalent right now. And um, I'm terrified that um, Cthulhu will decide to turn in his sleep, and <laughs> um, <laughs> which would change everything. But yeah, it's, they... a bit too late. it's a bit too late because we already opened the portals, Richard, with the movie. Hey, well, portals are opening. That's for sure, and there's also forces which are um, are vested against it. There's mm -hmm. um, a lot of folk out there who have um, been very determined to try and close the portals. Which um, I mean, that's no, that's not even me speaking. At so uh, that's um, I think what one of the fundamentalists said when they were dragged away after um, attacking that stone ring in New England but, um, last year was the guy shouted, "We're closing the portals." Mm -hmm. um, but same logic as the, um, when there was that um, Gonzo, um, what I take to be an art project um, two years ago when um, somebody started creating um, monoliths out of um, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 and leaving them at various points in the American mm -hmm. landscape. Um, usually those monoliths were aggressively attacked and, uh, and destroyed by um, essentially um, religious fundamentalists, American Christians with within um, two, three days of them being identified. Uh, um, so um, we've certainly seen a lot, of, a lot of direct attacks on what people assume to be portal areas, um, standing stones, um, ancient Neolithic sites. Um, here in the south of France, we've seen um, aggressive attacks on um, most of the um, key sacred sites, the, um, the, the church. 
So what, what happened in Rana Shatta when Asmodeus was decapitated by was she an Islamic fundamentalist? Um, uh, a woman broke, in, broke into the church and uh, decapitated the statue um, of Asmodeus, which is the holy water font next to the door. And I think it took a good few years for him to have his head uh, regenerated and replaced. Uh, I think it got replaced quite recently, didn't it? Way, um, Asmodeus has been restored. She also attacked um, the bar relief of Mary Magdalene on the altar. Wow. Um, she attacked Mary Magdalene and Asmodeus. Um, she um, she was a paralegal um, temp from Kian. Um, she claimed she was doing it to protest France's policies in Syria. Uh, but um, yeah, we've seen similar attacks on most of the sites, the, even the um, the Stell in Montsegur, the um, the Martyrs Memorial. Mm. Uh, and they've mm. been att multiple attempts to destroy the um, the Morency Cross over the years. The um, the, the stone face on the Morency Cross has been blasted of a shotgun. They've had people running cars into it, um, and um, it continues to um, yeah, to be a a touchy point. Um, if there's a, a force which wants to be reborn, and, uh, and if, if there's a um, a spiritual force which wants to um, re-manifest here in the south and in the mountains, uh, um, there's another force which is trying to keep it down. And we've we've also seen very vicious attacks on a lot of the English-speaking um, neo-Gnostic and neo-Cathar community out here. Wow. Mm. Oh, yeah. And for the audience, just in case, uh, Belly Bass uh, prophecy was 700 years last year. What was the date? I already forgot. Uh, it was um, August the 21st. It was August 21st. Yes. Yeah. So 700 years has passed. The prophecy has begun and I think it's beginning. It's beginning to take shape. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, you, oh, you know, uh, go ahead. Can I just interject um, just to say about that? As you know, I believe that the prophecy begins this year, not last year, because last year was when everybody died and um, Richard and I are talking about this. Um, this year is, is the new beginning, I think. So I think come March 16th this year, we will start to see the manifestation of the prophecy. That's my opinion anyway. It's my hope. I certainly pray so. I mean, every day I'm praying that um, peace, um, love, um, magic and sanity prevail. Um, last year was a, a, a strange um, vortex of unpleasant um, anniversaries and connections because it was exactly 700 years after the um, the death of the last Cathar adept, Guilhem Bellybast. But it was also exactly 777 years after the Le Chute de Montsegur, the fall of Montsegur and the burning mm -hmm. of the Cathar Martyrs, which um, the, the 777th anniversary fell on um, yeah, March 16. And um, in a, a, a trivial, but I think not unrelated detail of history, it was also exactly 77 years after the 3rd Panzer Division Das Reich rolled into the village of Montsegur and shot the partisans who were accused and pointed out by um, the mayor, the, ma the mairie, Monsieur Kuke, Madame Kuke's uncle, who identified the partisans who were summarily shot exactly um, 77 years ago last year. Um, so there's a whole um, fistful of sevens and all of them relate to um, what to me feel like um, manifestations of the the counter force, the uh, whatever whatever that force of gross materialism is uh, that um, every so often feels the need to um, to come to Montsegur and um, kill a few people to try and make its point. Uh, those archons indeed, yeah. I mean, even uh, Amanda and I were talking about how the interest there uh, from Annie Besson to the Nazis, I mean, <clears throat> to the ancient Romans, there's an interest in, in that area. And uh, as uh, I've discussed uh, when I first, I mean, again, I come from Lisbon and I've been to Sintra, so I've seen and experienced portals there myself. But then I started interviewing and reading the work of Patrice Chaplin and how there are these portals in southern Spain. And she talks about the secret society with Jean Cook, too, and all these big mystical wigs hanging out in, uh, in, in fascist Spain 
uh, during the time for those portals. And of course, now we have Southern France. I mean, what do you think, Richard? I, portals, meteorites, probably everything, right? This is a place of power, of magic, a place that people would be interested who want an experience and want power. Unfortunately so, yeah. Um, there is some kind of force here. And um, sadly, with a lot of folks, that um, means there's a desire to control it or to, yeah, to um, somehow um, bend that power to their own ends. In most cases, that comes down to people attempting to restrict access to the power places or to, um, or to gain control of them. In um, a lot of um, different countries, um, England in particular, it's virtually impossible to um, to, to to find a site where there is uh, free access. Um, places like Stonehenge have been um, rigidly controlled for um, years and years and years, and there's been a, a running battle over um, the summit of Montsegur for um, decades now. Um, thankfully, Montsegur is still free. Uh, and anyone has the right to climb the mountain at any time and to um, and to be there. And that's something that, um, yeah, all of us have um, fought for over the years to try and um, stop people from restricting access, building fences, gates, or um, issuing um, time-coded passes. Oh, uh, and you two, uh, yeah, I'm sure you two experience those portals all the time, right? Just admit it. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh... <laughs> We're saying nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to. It, it, I can tell. I know. <laughs> well, that's the reason I live here, obviously, is it's to be within, uh, within striking distance. And um, I also feel in some ways protected by it. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Definitely, definitely the place to be, a place of spirits, of history, of, uh, yeah, so much wonder. So is that what initially, what initially took you down to that area? Was it a call or what, uh, I think you moved down there, what, 2008, Richard? Yeah, I moved down there 2008, but in, in point of fact, the first time I came here was 1990. So I'd been um, visiting for a long period of time, and I think two, 2007 was round about the time where I realized that there was kind of pointless going back to the outside world, uh, and that I might as well just uh, stay put and dig in and do this full time. Wonderful, and I'm sure it's been yeah, quite an, quite an experience. Again, uh, there's part of me that's definitely very jealous, but uh, we are where we are needed. And... Uh, and what about you, Amanda? Quickly, could you tell the audience when you moved down there? I think because it's been now, what, uh, since our first interview, so it's been a little bit, it's been a while. What was it, Richard? I can't remember. Was it 2017? 2017, 2018? Yeah, it beats me. That's one of the problems of living in a pocket in space time, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just can't remember. It feels like forever since, I mean, for me, when I first went there, I just had this feeling that I had arrived where I had been looking for all of my life, this sense of home that I'd been searching for all over the world. I felt as soon as I spotted that, that pog in the distance, it was just this feeling of homecoming. And I think to be in a place like Monsegur, you never recover. It's like seeing the white lady you're never the same again when you have these experiences. And living in a place like Montsegur with everything that, that comes with it, it changes a person. You know, I said to Andrew when he asked what it's like, it's like an ongoing initiation living in a place like that. But it really is. And um, it, it, it tests you. It tests you to your limits as, as a human being, as a spiritual being. It really it really tests you. And I, I was warned, Richard warned me before I moved there and said, you know, if you have any gaps in your in your uh, in your spirituality or in your personal armor, then th those gaps will be exploited and you'll be tested. And that is how it truly is in such a place. Mm. You've been tested by your ego is tested, or what do you mean? Your, no. your well, your questioning of reality. What exactly? Um, everything that you you can believe as a human being living in a scientific age is challenged in a place like Montsegur. Um, 
the things that, that we see and have seen, the things that we feel and perceive, the things that happen there on an almost daily basis, even down to the weather conditions, how we can have extreme storms that shake the house. And, um, you know, we've seen people in the street going mad or, or friends of ours have seen going mad, like during the, the thunderstorms. Do you remember, Richard? Um, going really genuinely crazy because you're so high up, you're so close to the gods in a sense that there's no escape. And so everything that you are, I suppose it could be like taking drugs. I've not taken psychedelic drugs, but I think it could be like taking psychedelic drugs. Everything that you are and that you maybe hide from yourself, all of those fears or insecurities or you know personal things that we don't want to face um, are shaken to the surface in a place like that. Oh, I'm sure I remember as a kid in Portugal and also in Mexico, it was so wonderful living in these magic, realistic cultures because you know, my mom is driving me somewhere. Oh, there's a legend of the devil appearing here. There's a legend of this miracle here. Oh, by the way, this flower here, if you rub it, your love will come to you. This sort of folk magic that you live, magic realism every day is wonderful. And then you start having experiences again as uh, older my two extraterrestrial experience was one outside of Mexico City when I was a kid and in the mountains of Sintra, well, Areia, around that area. And oh. what I saw was not, unless that, yeah, you could say if there's some civilization or some breakaway civilization that has extremely advanced tech, I mean, I'm talking about extremely, like really smart space, space Nazis, I'll give it to them. But this stuff was nothing from this world. Let's put it that way. It was just uh, stars and meeting and dancing over the, the mountains over Sintra. It was, uh, it was amazing. And the funny thing is when I, I was with a group of people and my family, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we see that all the time. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's normal. <laughs> like, like Fatima, my mom knew people who had seen the sun and all this stuff for miles away and so, uh, yeah, it's a busy universe. It's nice to see this happen. And don't you guys agree? Instead of the the dry, yeah. rational world that we've, like Rich says, it's isolated us from everything. Can I just say something here? Um, I sure. remember when I was, Richard, do you remember that time we were driving with Lenny in the car coming from Ballester? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. so, not long. Not long after I'd moved to Montreal, we were driving from the local town with a friend and uh, it was daytime, kind of maybe six o'clock in the evening. And as we were driving through this very mystical, enchanted valley, um, as, the, as the car turned the corner, I saw something and you saw it too, Richard, he saw the tail end of it. It was like um, a neon blue light, like a shooting star. That came across the sky and I went oh look a shooting star but by the time I could finish that sentence the shooting star had slowed down in midair and then started to develop a head like the tail of a comet that that was red and then that kind of opened up into a kind of jellyfish type shape which is geometric with all these fronds hanging off it but it was gigantic of course and um and then it slowly 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 kind of like this gigantic astral jellyfish um went slowly down behind the trees and it was neon blue with red and pink and geometric shapes in it and it was as if as soon as i saw it it responded to being seen and it slowed down and then just gently went behind the trees because it knew that it had been seen and richard saw it too and uh very nonchalantly said oh yeah yeah I told you, I told you about those kind of things. Yeah, and no, I, I saw it just as it was going behind the trees and you it, you may recall it also related to the conversation we're having in the car at the time. Uh, and, um, I think we were talking about fairies. Um, yeah. Uh, because the, it, it, the conversation had turned to the other world uh, and then clack, um, you saw that thing over, <laughs> just just over the park. I looked out of the window and saw it just as it was going by in the trees and it was um, kind of over the east, the, the east side of the, the park. And yeah. um, I've had some issues with that myself. I mean, there's a lot of um, what you could only um, politely describe as um, UAPs um unidentified atmospheric phenomena 
were um, going all the time at um, months ago. I mean, you, you may recall that we were sat for hours watching flashes coming off the, the mountain and blips of light, which I have no idea what that is. A, um, spontaneous energy releases, things blipping in and out of existence. Um, a lot of the mountains are very solid iron. There's a lot of iron in the, in the Pyrenees. Um, so um, they're suddenly heavily magnetic. Um, and, um, there's some um, things going on with the electromagnetic fields in the area, which um, we don't fully understand that may be, um, yeah, some part of that. But um, yeah, what those things are, um, I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, um, I, I had a, an experience up on the POG I, um, a few years ago, where just when we were making color out of space, which of course was shot in Sintra, mm -hmm. so um, we know Sintra well. Um, I recall just before going off to go on color, I was up on the POG and um, saw an extraordinary um, shooting star on the, on the east side of the mountain, which um, it felt like it looked like a meteorite that was coming in really low that was um, bouncing off the outer edge of the Earth's stratosphere because it was kind of sparking and then jumping and sparking again, um, completely silent and um, going on a ways through the sky. Um, and then um, I put that down to being a um, yeah a meteor literally um, bouncing off the stratosphere. Uh, and then um, about um, eight months later after the shoot, I came back to the castle and um, climbed up and um, wandered back into the same spot in the um, the ruined village on the east face. And I remember thinking, oh, this is where I saw the um, the shooting star last time. Uh, and turned and looked back and saw it again. And the um, so the second time round, I was less certain it was a shooting star, um, which I think it was the same thing that um, we saw out of the car window. Um, the first time round, I told myself it was a meteor, but the chances of, um, of of seeing exactly the same atmospheric phenomena in exactly the same place twice is like seeing a, a leaf falling off a tree twice. I think the POG just did that to me to um, show me that I really still had no idea whatsoever what was really going on. <laughs> they are tricksters. They are tricksters. That's part of their game. I think they want us to be tricksters. And yes, there's <clears throat> the electromagnetic. Yeah, as, uh, this is a solid archaeological mainstream, but great civilizations always appear in places of high electromagnetic energy, like the pyramids across the world. And you probably they probably use it for some sort of scientific energy thing, but that's just normal. And there's a story my uncle was driving up Sintra and I was with him and he's like, and we're driving, we're driving down the mountain and he's like, oh, Miguel, check this out. And he turns off the car and he says, get out. And I got out, he puts it on neutral and the bloody car starts going up the hill. And he's like laughing because again, some sort of energy was off, right? Electromagnetic. Yeah. And these things happen all the time. It was hilarious. It was my uncle's like joke on people if he could so but uh, on the last day, <laughs> go ahead sorry, can I, on the last day of the shoot of the movie we had a lot of extraordinary experiences on the set of the movie didn't we richard very uh intense in Sintra. and on the last day of the shoot um i was driving home with my friend josephine who'd come on the shoot with me and richard was still up there filming and we were driving down the mountain and we got stuck. I mean, the the uh, it was a really weird atmosphere on the last day of the set. Energy was building up. I didn't feel comfortable. And there'd already been a few incidents whereby I knew, you know, on a magical level that things mm. were going to go a bit weird, that the spirits were not too happy with what we were doing, or there was just too much energy, too much of a build up. And that night I could feel something very strange. And so I decided to leave and go back to where we were staying in uh, Casa Casa Holstein in, in, uh, in the centre of Sintra. But Josephine, who'd been driving every day the whole time that we'd been there, we got in the car and suddenly the sat now stopped working. Not only did it stop working, it was spinning around like this, you know, it was it was scrabbling and distorted and just didn't didn't wasn't working. And uh, we and, but she, you know, the, the the drive down the mountain is not very long. And she'd done it a hundred times and yet we got lost and we were going round and round and round in circles at night in the dark and at one point we ended up in the forest 
the back end of the car going down a ravine and she started saying things from the script of the movie that she hadn't even read or seen. She started saying the words of Lavinia, saying, we're going to die here, we're going to die here, we're never going to get out of this place, we're all going to die here. And that's when I suddenly realised, OK, we've got to do something. So I drawing upon all my powers, I just invoked the spirits of the land there and I, I said to them, I'm so sorry, whatever we have done, you know, please accept our, our apologies and uh, give us safe passage out of here. And Josephine is normally an extremely level headed woman, you know, she, she's not the type to panic at all. So this is very unusual. But fortunately, I think they took pity upon us and she was able to drive, get the, the wheel back off the edge of the ravine and, and drive out of there in a state of panic. And then when we got back to um, where I was staying, she dropped me off. And as I got out of the car, I could feel this energy was behind me. And we had many, many steps going down to the apartment where we were staying, the cabin. And I, and I knew if I don't cling on to this barricade, this banister, I'm going to get pushed. So I was walking really slowly down all of these steps and the dog who is the um, the guardian of, of Tessa Holstone, who never speaks to anyone, is a very kind of antisocial dog and doesn't like people, came and pushed herself in front of me and then guided me down the steps and every few steps she would stop and look back and stop and look back and stop and look back mm. till I was in the cabin and she came into the cabin lay in front of the door and was growling at something outside the door and she didn't leave and then when Richard came back she she got in the bed with me so she was sleeping in the bed with me and growling at something in in the night and then when he came back at four o'clock in the morning she was still there and then she refused to leave and she was still there the next day when the bellboy arrived uh, around 10 o'clock and he said I've never seen this in all my years of working here this dog hates people. What is she doing? How is she in your in your cabin? What is she doing here? And uh, as soon as, as daybreak came and, and the bellboy arrived, she left. And she never came near me again after that. So something somewhere in, inspired her to, to protect me from whatever that energy was. And we still don't really know to this day what exactly happened. But, you know, that's another example of the power that's in Sintra and and the powers that we were engaged with when we were making the movie. Wow, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think uh, I think the great miracle is that and I told this to Amanda that Richard, after decades of rank failures, finally, we didn't we, we have not just a good, but a great adaptation of a Lovecraft story. And that's that's a miracle I never thought I would see in my lifetime. So thank you for that miracle, I have to say. <laughs> oh, thanks for enjoying it, sir. Well, OK, yeah, there were a lot of forces vested against it, obviously. Uh, yeah. um, Sintra is a super strange place, as you know. Uh, so um, it was um, channeling a lot of different um, crazy energies. We ended up in Sintra pretty much by accident um simply because it was the most um southwesterly point in europe and the um the warmest place we could shoot in january mm. and um also uh, we had to shoot somewhere where we could where we, where, where we could get alpacas alpacas were a deal breaker and i needed um ready access to um to a herd of alpacas so we ended up in Sintra, and only after getting in there started um realizing the um the extraordinary web of connections that um, bind the whole thing together. I mean, um, Sintra has always attracted, um, yeah, somewhat unusual folk from um, Alistair Crowley through to um, J.K. Rowling. Lord uh, Byron lived there. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there's an energy from Sintra down to Basque and Catalan country and all the way to southern france there's something in the mediterranean that is creating this incredible energy uh again i'm again patrice chaplin is convinced it's meteorites we know that the uh, the cult of cybele which was the most popular the biggest goddess of ancient times it's almost like all goddesses are a fragment or a version of cybele uh mm -hmm. 
and she was worshipped as a meteorite. Uh, what do you think, Richard? Have you? What does your research tell you? No, I totally would agree with that. The um, Phrygian goddess, um, whose body was um, carved out of a single um, meteoric aerolite, um, who was brought up the Tiber in a barge. She was certainly made out of the black stone, out of the out of the meteorite, and um, we can find um, some element of um, of meteor worship at the um, at the heart of a lot of the stuff. It would seem to me that the um, the goddess and the the grail are one. Um, um, some the black um, stone would seem to have um, yeah come from space millions of years ago. I think it's prevalent in um, it's turned up where it has in the Pyrenees because of the glaciation in the last ice age. Um, all of the um, the meteoric aerolites found in the Ariège were probably from a, a deep strata beneath the earth, um, and then were probably ploughed to the surface by the um, by glaciation during the the Arge de Glace. That's why you can find them in the caves and um, underneath the Pont de Diable down in the ravine. They're all in some kind of yeah deep strata under it all. And um, the Pyrenees have always been um, about iron. I mean, it's why the it kind of um, gave the Roman legions the iron they needed to make their spears and their armor and their swords. And a lot of folks think it's the Pyrenees because of all the fires, all the forges in the old days, and all the smoke rising from the the countless forges as they smelted the stuff. And there's Roman roads all over the place where they worked the mountains and traded with the Gauls. Yeah, for the iron. Uh, and again, that comes back to the um, the electromagnetic fields and the weird magnetism. And there's this combination of um, a high iron content and a lot of underground water, a huge amount of um, yeah underground water. There's a underground river beneath the Pog of Montsego. Um, the combination of yeah the iron and the running water seems to um, yeah create some kind of field, which I think acts directly on um, human consciousness. I think it certainly can affect um, brainwaves uh, and people's perception, which is um, one of the reasons why um, folk um, lose it in the electrical storms in Montsegur, for instance. The, um, a lightning strike sends out EMP, which affects cattle and can affect um, brainwaves mm -hmm. and can also induce epilepsy. So um, a lot of the time here yeah, we're um, we commonly think that, yeah, um, Paradise and Les Enfers, Heaven and Hell, are um, always accessible, or always just a, a little notch of the dial away, like um, it, things can be absolutely marvellous and um, just a, a slight um, turn of events and one could be plunged into, um, into pure, uh, something purely infernal. Uh, as, as you say, it's testing to the point where it's a bit like... Um, the way water finds its way into a stone, it'll it'll like find its way into any little niche, and then when um when winter comes and it turns to ice, it'll it'll splinter it right open. Uh, it, it it tests you in every single way, and um, forces one to constantly reappraise one's belief systems. Like um, I, out here, I've often thought everything works a bit like um. A TV show like Lost or um, or Game of Thrones. The only thing you can be sure of is that your friends this season will probably be your arch enemies next season, and your arch <laughs> this season will probably be your closest allies and will unexpectedly save you next season. So it's uh, but yeah. super, super testing. <laughs> when I first moved to Montego, it was the middle of winter, and uh, Richard and I were kind of snowed in and. I'd never seen Game of Thrones and he told me this metaphor at the very beginning and so we were watching the Game of Thrones I was catching up with the whole thing and he explained this to me and then I remember him saying oh and you better you better enjoy this make the most of this because this period of peace will not last mm. and I thought what can possibly happen up a mountain you know in a tiny little place 200 people what can happen little <laughs> did I know yeah. yes <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, weird. always there are people passing through looking for the Holy Grail or looking for Otto Rahn or looking for the Cathars or looking for something. You know, many people have had dreams or visions, as I've said to you before, that have called them to the mountain. 
Mm. So there is always a person wandering through looking for help, looking for something. That's very cool. Very cool. And um, God, what was I going to say? <clears throat> and interesting about the going back to Cybele, I heard of this myth of Cybele that she is like Sophia. She's actually a fallen being, you might say, like Lucifer, because in the myth, she's up there in the divine realm. And for some strange reason, she's a hermaphrodite and she decides to castrate herself and falls out in this. I don't know about disgrace. Some cultures, there's no disgracing a god. And she becomes yeah. a woman and comes into this world. Of course, that harkens to Sophia, who's also with her Aeon and decides, I want to do things on my own. And she falls out of the pleroma as a woman. And I think, you know, it's not gross. It's somehow with individuation and the the lunar powers deciding to come. And of course, it ties in with the whole meteorite thing. What are meteorites? Maybe you could say they're cast away from the heaven of their planet or something like that. So it's exactly. fun how these myths work. Yeah, that's exactly how I would have thought of it. Um, where did the meteorites come from? You know, some people say they come from the planet Venus. Mm -hmm. And Venus was originally apparently twinned with Earth. And then there is this whole idea of, of Montsegur being a Venusberg, isn't there, Richard? And Lucifer, the stone, you know, Lucifer's um, stone coming from Venus also, or being Venus. Yeah, that's an interesting correlation, that's for sure. And. Uh... I mean the yeah the diadem of Lucifer explanation is um, yeah it's the, the, just to recapitulate the myth that's the idea that um, Lucifer the archangel had a, um, a diadem a stone on his forehead which um, fell from his brow when he was cast out of heaven and fell to earth and the um, it's Lucifer's diadem the crown of Lucifer that was allegedly fashioned into the Grail and hence the um, the servants of Lucifer still pursue their um, their master's lust diadem him in the hope that the rebel angel can um, find his way back into heaven again, so, which um, yeah has a very um, a very meteoric um, feeling about it. Uh, and um, one of the things that just baffles me about this whole mess is um, why it is that the uh, forces of matriarchy and patriarchy are um, so at odds over over Montsegur. Uh, how it came that uh, we've got this um, this goddess force and this um, feminine um, lunar energy in the place, which is um, so evident, but at the same time constantly opposed by um, by by aggressive patriarchal forces, which are, um, are trying to put it down one way or another. Uh, it's like uh, being caught in a in a marital spat between um, two deities. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's still the battle of Marduk and Tiamat or Tiamat. I think that's that's where it all went wrong, I think. Marduk, civilization, really? logic, math, all that good stuff. But when you get rid of the lunar powers, intuition, uh, holistic, wisdom, a medicine, Indeed. herbal medicine, then things go, yeah. It, well, look at the human race for the last few thousand or thousands of years where... We're fragmented, just like a meteorite, don't you guys think? <laughs> just like Tiamat, that's what Marduk did to Tiamat. He chopped her up into lots of pieces. Yeah, yeah, just because, uh, what was it? Yeah, the, her and her concert, the gods were being too loud, like kids making noise. So they decided to have them killed off. It's a great myth. I love it. Um, to a kid, that would make perfect sense. But to us grownups, it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, the gods don't really mess around though it's the thing <laughs> yeah. different morality we yeah, yeah. We're in a, like you were saying uh, richard they have a different morale like these beings you meet out in the woods uh, these tricksters there but we pre we can project all we want but we lose yeah we don't know what they are i mean um in the um the time i've been out here i've pretty much become a subscriber to um, John Keel's theory about um, ultra terrestrials mm -hmm. or ultra dimensionals. Uh, it's, uh, I think um, Lovecraft's old ones that exist beyond our spectrum and mm -hmm. the, um, the extraterrestrials and the inhabitants of the, um, the fairy other world um, would have, uh, at the, on the basis of um, my own experience seem to be the same thing. 
and um, it seems to me that they inhabit um, some other um, vibrational frequency, um, which is um, essentially intangible to us. But um, it seems to me that they come from here, like um, whatever that those those lights were we see we saw on the pog. I'm no longer convinced it was something falling from outer space. I think it's something that lives up there. That's on some, uh, that's on some other um, some other channel or frequency. Uh, so, yeah, uh, throughout this area, there's that constant sense of uh, proximity to um, to forces which are completely beyond our perception, let alone our our understanding, and they they're not human. Uh, they they don't behave in the, in, in human ways or um, yeah um, conform to um, my abilities to second guess what they're up to. <laughs> yeah, in yeah. 2021, I went full John Keel to Richard. I said he's right. You know, it still aligns with the Gnostic view, but I was like, I think he's as right. And 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 uh, what well, Charles Fort too had more or less the same ideas as Keel. I think they were both spot on on their cosmologies in our reality today. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of it? The reason that Richard and I met was because I was working for an esoteric uh, web TV channel in Paris, and mm -hmm. um, I was told part of my job was to research interview guests for the show. And so Richard's name came up, and he added me on his uh, private Facebook group, Terra Umbra, and there I saw him talk about his experiences with the white lady and the correlation to the um, apparitions at Lourdes. And mm -hmm. suddenly I realized that someone else had seen what I had seen just a few months before, because when I saw the white lady, I didn't know anyone else who'd seen her apart from the man at the following day. And so to meet Richard and to have him say, oh yeah, there's lots of us. You know, there's loads of us who've seen her and there's like a, a whole culture of the White Lady in the Pyrenees. Um, it was a huge revelation for me and a validation and a surprise too. And so this is how Richard and I first met because of the White Lady, because we had both seen this otherworldly being that defied any explanation. And when I say see, I'm talking about a physical manifestation, not just a a ghost or an apparition, but something with, with density and weight and heat and light and yeah. And so since when I went to Monsecure, of course, then I had my own meeting with the white lady there. And uh, the most recent time was when we were driving back from Sintra and we went to the, the park for the March 16th celebration. And that was an extremely intense experience too. And so it kind of ties in with this idea that in a place like Monsecure, you know, we are we are operating, we are accessing these different frequencies that John John Keel talks about. There is a bleed through in the dimensions, I believe. No, for sure. And for for the audience that might not know, the White Lady, who is she, Amanda? Do you want to say, Richard? You go first. Okay. Well, I saw some. I, I had a, a visitation um, when I was in Orsaville, um, not long after I moved to France in 2016. I went to a volcanic region to pray for 200 people as part of an international prayer pilgrimage that I was part of. Um, in the night, I was sleeping at the hotel opposite the church, and suddenly I woke up. I had a dream about an extremely bright, otherworldly light. And the dream was so powerful that it woke me up. And then when I opened my eyes, I saw that the light was in the room. I was not dreaming. And I could feel the adrenaline going through my body. And then the light took the shape of a woman's body um, at the end of the bed, about eight foot high, um, hovering. And she had uh, a cloak, but I couldn't see her face at all. She had no facial features. And she had a red light where her heart would be. It was scintillating. And then she spoke to me in this very high pitched crystalline voice. And she said, um, you called me. Oh, no, sorry. First of all, she said, um, people think they come here to see the Black Madonna. And so I went to pray at this Black Madonna statue. 
people think they come here to see the Black Madonna, but this is what I really look like. And then she said, you called me, so what do you want? And of course, I could not speak, let alone formulate a thought. I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't quite believe what was happening. And, um, and so in response to that, she extended this filament of light, which scanned up and down the center of my body for hours and hours. And then at the end of this uh, um, experience, which put me into a, a, an ecstatic um, trance state, um, she said, what you want is the truth and the truth you shall have. And then she said, and if you want to know the truth about your boyfriend who was sleeping in the next room, look on his phone. I think I might have told you the story. And um, of course I said no, and I immediately like got out of the trance, said no, and she disappeared. And then of course I was in a state of shock because this was a real experience, um, impossible to explain to anyone else at that time. But then fortunately the next day, once I'd started to recover, I met a man in the local shop opposite the church who'd had, and I asked him, do you know anyone who's ever had a strange experience here? And I didn't give him any details and he said, yes, me. And then he, he told me that he would had pretty much an identical experience one year before. And so the white lady is a manifestation, I believe, of some intermediary being or goddess who is here um, on the earth plane to help humanity in some way. Um, and she's a part of the earth, so it's not like she's just here to help us, but she needs our help also, is my theory. Um, the one on one ago is a different iteration, I believe, of the same type of being. And uh, other people have seen different iterations in different locations. We spoke about Fatima. Um, so I believe that whoever she is and whatever she is, she has a purpose to be here. And I think there are greater and lesser iterations in different locations. So the lady in Montsegur is a higher iteration again of the one that I saw, the first one that I saw. Would you agree, Richard? Well, um, yeah, to try and put this um, ultra-dimensional metaphysical force in a, in a nutshell, um, yeah, I moved to Montsegur after experiencing a, um, a, 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 a a close encounter with the um, the White Lady of Montsegur, um, realizing that it wasn't a myth. And um, since that time, um, I've looked very carefully into the region, and um, all around Montsegur, there's been, uh, any number of sites where there have been um, alleged Marian apparitions over the years. Like um, just around the back, the corner, there's a cell, and that cell you've got the source of the apparition where um, the white lady appeared in the 17th century. Go the other way, and you get to Notre Dame de Val d'Amour, a lady of the Valley of Love outside Ballester, where again there's a, a, a site where the white lady is supposed to have appeared. So um, these apparitions are probably happening for um, for centuries. But what's um, particularly interesting about Montsegur in the scheme of things is that um, Montsegur was anathematized by the Holy Roman Church. Montsegur stood against the Holy Roman Church, and those people were slaughtered by the Catholics and burned alive there. And then subsequent papacies cursed Montsegur for hundreds of years, and um, on the anniversary of the burning, people were forced to drag across through the streets in penance. So uh, why would a Marian apparition be appearing in a place that was shunned by the uh, by the Catholic Church? Um, which uh, was yeah, uh, super intriguing and immediately suggests that the force is something which um, exists beyond, outside of um, the the Holy Roman dogma. And um, I would I would suggest this probably is the same force that's manifested at um, Lord and um, in Fatima. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, I shot a documentary about um, basically springboarded off, uh, springboarding off the original white lady encounter in Montsegur, which is a film called The Other World. Mm -hmm. And um, we're currently trying to look for a home for a new documentary called um, The Last The Last Secret of Fatima. Wow. So it's um, sitting on the shelf looking for a home right now. Um, but yeah, I've been 
digging into the white lady apparitions throughout the region. And since um, moving to Montsegur, it became clear that many other people were experiencing the same thing, um, simply describing it by a different label or um, putting it for different perception. I mean, you may recall the that the Irish shaman guy who was there when um, going on yeah. about seeing the angel. Um, but his description of the angels no real different from um, yeah the white lady or um, Lars Mule in his book um, writes about an identical um, glowing um, feminine apparition that he refers to as Pratt for some reason. Mm. No, incredible! What a force, and it's there. Yeah, uh, there's accounts from the 1920s and 30s as well, which are extremely compelling. And um, basically, seem to be um, describing exactly the same thing, and often um, giving giving the um, the same spot. Um, the Maurice Marg in his book, um, the Unknown Master of the Albigensians from um, 1930, talks about how um, she, um, the spirit of um, Esclamond is still um, present in the north facing tower, and um, yeah, literally um, gives the coordinates of the thing. Amazing. Yeah, and it should be mentioned too, uh, whether it's Fatima or even uh, Guadalupe, when, you know, in Guadalupe, you've got the, the kid and Fatima, you've got the girls. They, they never say the Virgin Mary. They say a woman, a very otherworldly woman. So there's an archetypal image. And as you're saying, Richard, that it's beyond the church. Way, um, I mean, it's the same. The same in Lord. I mean, uh, mm. when Bernadette first saw the, um, the the white lady at the Grotto of Masabiel, um, she wasn't sure whether it was a demon or whether it was um, a spirit mm. of the dead. And they tried throwing stones at it. They tried throwing holy water at it. Um, she didn't want to talk about it. It was her sister who ratted her out to her mom. And uh, it, it, it took a while before they finally took it to the town priest and rationalised it as being an apparition of the Virgin. Mary, and um, but that's I guess what happens when you're dealing with uh, an ultra-dimensional um, intrusion into your into your perception. Uh, you've got to try and fumble through the mental rolodex to find some kind of yeah definition or label to put on it to to um, to figure out how to how to deal with the experience. Yeah, we do the best we can in our culture. We might call them aliens. We might call them angels, spirits. Uh, we do the best we can with our, as I, with our, uh, what did Russ say in, uh, in True Detective? We sentient meat. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh. Our monkey brains, if you would. We do the best we can. <laughs> in France, there is a long tradition of calling her the, the Dame Blanche, which is where the name the white lady comes from. And usually when people speak about a white lady, it's presumed to be a ghost, you know, uh, usually of a, some noble woman who's died under some tragic circumstance. But in France, it's a totally different uh, meaning. And she, she has a very long history. And Richard uh, pointed out to me that one of the most ancient goddess sculptures known in history was found in the Pyrenees and was carved from a, was it a, a mammoth tusk, Richard? Well, in fact, there's a, a, a lot of them. Um, the one I've got around my neck is, uh, I think, was the Dame de Brassempoy. Um, yeah. um, I think she was made from a horse's tooth originally, mm -hmm. but okay. horse's teeth and mammoth ivory, there's um, um, many of them different um, goddesses that have been found in the um, the Pyrenean caves. and. Um, yeah, the um, Dame de Brassempoix is one of the first representations of the human face known to art. Um, so right at the very dawn of time when people were coming out of the, the Ice Age, they, they were, um, they, their first impetus was to, I guess, um, sculpt the goddess to, um, and I guess given that we're all um, born from our mothers, it makes some kind of sense that um, maybe the, 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 the um, the female form was the um, the first thing that um, we were compelled to um, to sculpt or create. I often wonder how you know when um, when the phrase "mama" first um, turned up, and to what extent that's the um, the first thought or the first word. Very true. Very true. Well, this is yeah. This has been a great conversation. I feel 
we haven't gotten to Mary Magdalene. I hope we're not pissing her off because uh, that's yeah. the last person we want to do. But we also want to give her justice because like the Cathars, history has a way of suppressing uh, Mary Magdalene or twisting it around or appropriating somebody who's part of this goddess vibe, white lady, Sophia, Cybel. She is somewhere in there and she's history changing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get Mary there. Mary Magdalene's sure. been subject to cancel culture too, in that she was, um, yeah, completely edited out of the uh, out of the record and out of the book, and the uh, was the same um, slavish attention to completely obliterating um, all trace of her existence. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, some folks would say there's an argument to reason that the Cathars were obliterated because they had the um, the last gospel of Mary Magdalene. So, um, mm. plus, as I mentioned before, you know, I was told in the, the folk tradition of Occitania that some people say the Cathars believed they were descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And that's another reason they were routinely hated for saying such a heretical thing. That was told to me by someone who shall remain nameless, but who, you know, had very deep esoteric connections with the region, plus whose family had lived there for all of these generations. But it was okay for the Merovingians to claim this, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not well, the commoner, the not the commoner. Uh, they were in power at that time when they started yeah. it. You know, he who is in power time. can blaspheme all they want. Yeah, uh, same as it ever was. So well, yeah, yeah, we should definitely uh, regroup and do a show on Mary Magdalene next for sure. But uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I think we should probably pause what an incredible uh discussion we've had and there's so much more and i think uh, eventually we'll chip away and people hopefully will find their own portals that's what i keep telling them go on that inner journey find that place and energy where you just dissipate as you know as i tell people love is simply the destruction of time and the tools are out there where you just go into the eternal so but don't let me get into a tangent first amanda of course always awesome talking to you off record on record whatever it is whatever medium it is it's awesome and thank you thank you too one thing i'd like to add there is that when i connected with the white lady that the overarching feeling is of love and that is truly what she is and what she represents and it's a love for humanity and it's a love for all of us and it's this and it's not only that she wants to be venerated because she doesn't, she wants to love us and to bring us back into her fold and to take care of us. And, and I don't really fully understand yet, but I know it's a two way street and that we are also needed to do her work. Um, that's certainly the feeling that I have whenever I've connected with her in any of the formats that she's shown herself. Well said, and I would agree. Well, Richard, well, thank you, really Miss. Uh, um, and if I can also make one point, yeah, um, I, I've also with the with those moments with the lady felt um, a sense of overwhelming love, uh, and that sense that the lady loves me uh, um, made me feel that I had been forgiven for all of my trespasses in this world, uh, and um, I remained super loyal to. Her. And if there's um, one point I want to <clears throat> dot the eye on before parting, um, you, you mentioned where does the meteorite come from? Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, probably everything else, if, um, the, if our idea of the physical universe is correct, it came from the Big Bang. Uh, at some point, all of the matter and energy in the universe was concentrated in one point. At one point, it was pure energy, and that somehow that pure energy congealed and solidified into, into super dense iron. Uh, it became matter, uh, but imprisoned within the iron is still the original light of the Big Bang. The, origi the, the original light is always within it. So I think the white lady and the, the black mother are the two aspects of the, um, the, of the same force. Uh, if the meteor is something, it's, it's spirit impr imprisoned in matter and light that has taken on the, the dense vibration of matter that um, remembers that it's light and um, I think wants to be liberated. 
Oh, that's really well said. And what a powerful, well, literally or metaphorically, it's it's so true. That has to be. It's what we all know deep in our bones, right? Somewhere. Right. Awesome. Well, Richard, I really appreciate you coming on the show for the first time. It's been a great discussion. And thanks for everything and everything you do. Mm, you too, sir. Take care out there. Mm -hmm.